Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 10, Lesson 7 on solids and their cross sections. So for the final three lessons of this particular unit and of this particular course, we're going to be looking at three dimensional objects which are known as solids. And if you didn't watch our, our series of videos in Math 6, just remember, when we talk about a solid, we're not particularly talking about a solid in the sense of solids, liquids, and gases. We're just talking about something that takes up three-dimensional space. Most often, that probably is referring to something that is a solid, right? Because a gas and a liquid would just kind of go like this. But just keep in mind that this is somewhat of a different idea than solid, liquid, gas. Anyhow, let's jump in to some review work with solids. Now, we live in a world where objects have three dimensions. Geometric objects in 3D space are known as solids. One of the most common solids is a prism. So let's take a look at what a prism is. Prisms are three-dimensional solids that have parallel polygon bases, all right, that are identical, and all other faces, which are known as lateral faces, are parallelograms, okay? So it's kind of cool. You could create a prism yourself. You know, you could take some kind of polygon. It could be a triangle, a rectangle, a parallelogram, a pentagon, a hexagon, I don't care, uh, an octagon. Imagine taking two stop signs that are identical, you know, stacking them up, okay, making sure that they're parallel with each other, okay, and then connecting each one of the vertices of the octagon with the ones below them or above them, however you want to think about it, and you'd have a prism, all right? And it just so happens that, again, all of those lateral faces end up being parallelograms. So let's take a look at a good example of a prism in exercise number one. A right prism is shown below. Answer the following questions based on this prism. Letter A, how many faces does the prism have? Okay, so just as a reminder, with three-dimensional solids, we call their sides we call them faces instead of sides. I mean, it wouldn't be horrible if you called them sides, all right? But we're trying to distinguish that between the side of a polygon, right? So how many faces does it have? How many flat two-dimensional objects enclose this particular prism? Why don't you pause the video and just count? All right, well, we'll always have two bases, right? One on the top, one on the bottom. So that's two. Then we have three, four, five, six, seven lateral faces. So we've got two bases plus five lateral, and that'll be seven faces. Now, side note, of course we have seven faces, right? Because we've got a five-sided figure up here, a five-sided figure down here, so that's two bases. And then for every side of this five-sided figure, we have a lateral face and a lateral face, right? Now, letter B. What are the shapes that serve as the bases of, this, of the prism? You should know this. Why don't you pause the video and write down what you would call that two-dimensional figure? All right, well, you just have to know what a five-sided polygon is called. And I hope that by this point, everyone knows that that's a pentagon, right? Five-sided, a pentagon. So, you know, you could call this a pentagon prism, all right? A pentagon prism. Now, letter C. Why do you think it's called a right prism as opposed to just a prism? What do you think that, like, term means, a right prism. Why don't you write something down now? Well, right generally implies that you've got some perpendicular thing going on. Specifically, specifically, the lateral faces are perpendicular to the bases. faces are perpendicular to the bases. And those are the easiest type 
of prisms to work with. Eventually, when we do volume of prisms, we're going to confine ourselves to just right prisms so that those lateral faces are all perpendicular to whatever the bases are. Now, let's take a look at letter D. What types of specialized shapes are the lateral faces, sides, of this prism? All right. So because it's a right prism, uh, now any prism, right, the lateral faces would be parallelograms. But because it is a right prism, what kind of specialized shapes are the lateral faces? Well, they're rectangles, right? Rectangles are all about right angles, and every one of those lateral faces is now a rectangle as long as we've got a right prism. Okay, and right prisms are critically important. If you look around in the world, you'll actually see them all over the place. Now, they might not be lying on their base, right? And I just want to be very clear. If I took this thing and I somehow rotated it, right, so that the lateral faces were horizontal and the bases were vertical, it would still be a right pentagonal prism, all right? It still would be, right? It doesn't change depending on the orientation of the figure, right? A solid is a solid, no matter what kind of orientation it's in. All right, let's keep working. All right, now, we oftentimes want to slice a three-dimensional solid. And when we slice a solid with a flat plane, I mean, again, just, just imagine taking like a bread knife or something like that and cutting a slice and you know, pulling that solid apart. When we slice a solid with a flat plane, we, call, call, eh, we create what's called a cross-section, a little tongue-tied there, which is just another two-dimensional shape, all right? So let's take a look at exercise number two and a couple cross-sections. The triangular prism shown below is also a right prism. It has cross-sections created by a slice parallel to the bases and one created that is perpendicular to the bases. Letter A, describe the cross-section parallel to the basis. So the cross-section that's parallel to the basis, right, is this one, right? You could call it cross-section ABC. And then the one that's perpendicular to the basis is EFGH, that one. So I'd like you to describe this cross-section as well as you can. Tell me, you know, anything you can about that cross-section. Pause the video now. Well, it's kind of cool, right? Because this cross-section, as all horizontal cross-sections would be here, is a triangle identical to the two bases, right? And that would be true of any cross-section I drew on a prism. All right, it wouldn't even have to be a right prism. All right, as long as it's a prism, then what's true is when I slice a horizontal cross section, or better yet, a cross section that is, let's say, um, parallel to the two bases, right, then what's gonna happen is I will get an identical, identical two dimensional figure as the two bases. And I'm sure that, that my beautiful drawing there convinced you of that. All right, yeah, maybe not. All right, <laughs> let, me, let me delete that guy and delete that guy just to get him out of there. Um, if only I'd drawn them well enough, I could have maybe moved them and, and shown you that a little bit better. All right, so now let's talk about cross sections that are perpendicular to the base like what we have there. Why don't you pause the video now and describe that one? Well, it's a rectangle, okay? Definitely a rectangle, just like all the lateral faces are. But it's not an identical rectangle, right? Any horizontal cross-section would have been identical. But it's a rectangle whose size depends on where we draw it. Right? So. I'm going to take another shot at drawing another cross-section on here. It's probably not going to be very pretty, right? But one thing you could definitely do, right, because this is a right prism, all the lateral faces are rectangles. And you could kind of compare this rectangle with the one right over here, and it definitely looks smaller. 
In fact, if I kind of came in here and I tried to draw one of those cross sections, right, then I'd have a very, very thin rectangle, right? All the rectangles would have the same height, right? They'd all have whatever that height is, but they would kind of get smaller as you went this way. And of course, I could also have kind of some, some vertical cross sections that went more like this. You know, they wouldn't even have to be parallel. All right, they'd still be rectangles, but they'd be differing sized rectangles, all with the same height, all right, but their, their areas would be different depending on where we draw them. All right, so let's keep going. Prisms are very important, but one of the other figures that you'll see, one of the other solids that we'll encounter, is the pyramid, right? And that is a lateral, that is a figure where all the lateral faces are always triangles, right? Only one base, just one base, and again, it could be anything. I mean, pyramids are really, really cool. We're used to pyramids that have like quadrilaterals, four-sided figures as their bases, or maybe even triangles as their bases. But you could even take an octagon, right? Take your, your stop sign, lie it flat, put a point above that, that octagon, and then connect every vertex of the octagon with that top point, known as the vertex of the, the pyramid, and you'd have another pyramid, all right? So let's take a look at exercise number three. A pyramid is shown below. Answer the following questions. Letter A. This is known as a rectangular pyramid. Why do you think it's called that? Hmm. Well, it's pretty simple, right? The word that's right here is going to describe the base. So it's called this because, whoops, ah, man, me and the word because because its base is a rectangle. Now the way that it's drawn, right, in what's called a perspective drawing, it may not look like that's a rectangle, right? It certainly looks like it's at least a parallelogram, okay? But because it's kind of tilted and we're looking at it from a particular angle, right, it may not look like a rectangle, and I don't think it does. In fact, if I had drawn it that it looked like a rectangle, then that would mean that we were sort of staring at the pyramid straight in this direction, which would be a little bit odd. All right, let's take a look at letter B. If slices were made parallel to the base, what two-dimensional shapes would result? Would they all be the same size, the same type? Draw some and describe as well as you can. <laughs> so now I'd like you to attempt what I did a really poor job of on the front side of the sheet. I'd like you to try to draw some cross sections that are parallel to this rectangular base and then I want you to tell me what kind of figures they are and are they all the same size. Draw at least two of them. All right. One of the golden rules, by the way, of three-dimensional drawing is that lines that are parallel will continue to look like they're parallel no matter how you draw the three-dimensional figure, as long as you're not using what's called a vanishing point technique, and I, I'm not going there. Anyway, so in other words, if I want to draw one of these cross sections, you know, I might start by drawing a line like this that's parallel to that original base, or as good as I can, then this line, which is parallel to that side, and this line, which is parallel and that's not what I wanted to do, right there and there. So that's one cross section, right? One horizontal cross section. Let me do one that's up here, way up top. Let me put one there, put one there, put one there, and put one there. Okay, so you can kind of see this, right? If I'm just slicing this pyramid. So what's true about those cross sections? Well, number one, they're also gonna be rectangles, okay? Now I know they look like parallelograms, which they are because a rectangle is a parallelogram. Also rectangles that get smaller as we approach the pyramid's vertex. Now, that's kind of different from a prism, right? With a prism, anytime we do a cross-section that's parallel to the bases, we get a cross-section that is identical to the bases. 
On the other hand, in a pyramid, when we do a cross section that's parallel to the bases, it's the same shape as the base. So if we had an octagon down here, then all of our cross sections would be octagons, but, and this should be probably pretty obvious, they must get smaller as we go higher and higher on the pyramid, right? Because if we drew one basically that was all the way up at the top, we'd barely have any cross section at all. Now, the vertical slices of pyramids are much more tricky, right? So let's just take a look at a couple possible vertical slices along this pyramid. Take a look at letter C. Slices of pyramids with vertical planes are more complicated to visualize. Name each type of shape shown below that is created when this pyramid was sliced with a vertical plane. All right, so you know, in this case, I took a vertical plane and I kind of sliced it diagonally. And in this case, I took a vertical plane and I actually sliced it with a slice that was sort of parallel to one side of the base, okay? And what were the two figures that I sliced? What were those two cross sections? Pause the video now and write them down. It should be probably pretty easy. All right, well, for a vertical cross section number one, pretty obvious that that's a triangle. I mean, there's no kind of getting around that. Number two, it's a little bit trickier, but I hope that you recognize that what we have there is a trapezoid, right? And it makes sense that we've got a trapezoid, right? Because this top segment where the slice would kind of exit the pyramid at the top, that's going to end up being parallel with this one at the bottom. And remember, a trapezoid is any four-sided figure that has at least one pair of parallel sides. It's also pretty obvious that like coming down out here, right, those two sides likely wouldn't be parallel. In fact, I can't imagine a scenario where they would. Okay, let's wrap this up. So a pretty short and easy lesson today, right? What we wanted to review were the two major types of solids that you study in middle school, actually. Now in eighth grade, you will do some additional solids like the sphere and the cone, okay? But primarily in sixth and seventh grade, you concentrate on the prism and the pyramid, right? So we reviewed what those two types of figures were, and we also reviewed how you can slice those figures either vertically or horizontally to see cross sections. By the way, if you've ever seen a three-dimensional printer, all right, my son's got one of those. Lots of both middle schools and high schools now have three-dimensional printers. What a three-dimensional printer does is it actually always prints a cross-section that's parallel to the base. So whatever the figure is, whether the figure is a prism, a pyramid, a sphere, a random like figure, it doesn't matter. The thing always prints a horizontal cross section. Then the printer moves up just a little bit and prints another horizontal cross section on top of it. Then it moves up a little bit and prints another horizontal cross section, right? So literally, the three-dimensional printer is constructing a three-dimensional object out of two-dimensional cross sections. How cool is that? All right, well, we will obviously work more with prisms and pyramids in the last two lessons of this unit. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.